Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're watching and what time you're watching today. Uh, it's good to have you watch wherever you are, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Natasha. I'm a member here at Wesley. It's good to be able to gather online, and we thank God for the technology that enables us to do it, uh, just so that we can hear God's word and worship in our homes. As much as we'd all love to be together again, uh, let's make the most of this opportunity of being in our homes. Uh, you don't have to shush the kids as much, and you can have a hot drink and finish your breakfast, uh, multitasking at its best. Um, as the kids have gone back to school, we've been finding our feet again. I'm sure all of you have been as well. Uh, it's gotten a lot busier. Um, and it's been great to have being able to focus on one thing at a time so you can take the kids to school and come back and work. Uh, but I pray that it's been a good week for you and it hasn't been too much of an adjustment. But whatever kind of week it's been for you, uh, for some it's been good, for some it hasn't been as good. Or maybe it's been just a bit meh. Uh, let's lay it down. If our hands and our hearts are full of worry and care, we won't be able to lift them up and worship our King. So as we come to the throne of grace, let's lay down our burdens uh, and take up the yoke of the Lord, which is light, and praise God. And let's just pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that we can come into your presence. We thank you that because of the finished work of Jesus that we can come before your throne, whole and righteous before you. We thank you for your love, Lord, who, who, which calls us to you, Lord, which draws us to you. And Lord, we know that you just want a relationship with us, and we want a relationship with you, Father God. And we just want to have that right standing with you. And we pray that as we worship, as we hear your word, as we listen to your word, Lord, spoken to us and read to us, and as we praise you in song, Lord, that it'll be a pleasing sacrifice to you today. We just love you, Father God, and we lay the service before you. We lay every person before you who, uh, who's going to take part, Lord, whether they're reading or whether they're uh, listening. Lord, that their lives might be changed, Father God, from hearing your word. We just give you all the glory today, and we praise you, and we lay it all at your feet, Lord so that we can lift our hands in worship to you. Thank you, Lord, for your love today. Amen. Uh, I now hand you over to Tunde, who will bring our call to worship. Good morning, church. I'm going to lead you in a call of worship, and I'm excited to do that. We are going to um, read from uh, Psalm 103. Uh, it's a long psalm, so we'll just read the first 13 verses and we'll end with verse 19. So that's the first 13 verses and then we just end with 19. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Praise the Lord my soul and all my innermost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives your sins and heals all your diseases, who remembers your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Hallelujah. He made known his ways to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he abhor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who hear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed all, as removed our transgression from us. As the Father has compassion in his children, so the Lord has compassionate on those who fear him. 
Let's go to this, um, verse 19 now. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Just a good reminder for us. And now Joe is going to lead us in a song of worship. Nothing can separate Even if I ran away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have new mercies for me every day Your love never fails Stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me. Your love never fails Your love never fails When the strong and the water's deep When I'm not alone here in these open seas Your love never fails Chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side Your love never fails You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning Oceans rage. I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. Your love never. together for my good you make all things work together for my good you make all things work together for my good you make all things work together for my good you stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me your love never fails Your love never fails You made all things work together for my good You made all things 
work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. Thank you, Joe. How many haircuts have you had more? And Martin, thank you for leading us in worship. Uh, we continue with the book of Ruth this week, and the theme is about desiring a Jesus-shaped life. And we look forward to Jeff sharing with us later. I love the book of Ruth, not just because it's a love story, but it really shows that how the actions that we have have a generational impact. Spoiler alert, but did Ruth know that by picking wheat from a field to feed herself and Naomi, she would be the great, 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 great grandmother of the Messiah? Did Boaz know but that by filling the role of kinsman redeemer that he would be a great grandfather to a king? I don't know, but I know that God did, and that's amazing. Uh, we also mentioned last week that we'll be starting to memorize Bible verses. Our Bible verse this week is from Psalm 19, 119. Not all 176 verses, just 11 and 105, you'll be glad to hear. Uh, so you can download it from the description in the video. Uh, and you'll also have something coming to you in the email, which will give you lots more information and resources. Uh, so we look forward to how you present that uh, and how you do it in the week. Uh, Michael and Amanda. Uh, Michael is one of our trustees, um, and they'll be leading us in prayer now. Over to you, Michael. Lord Jesus, through you all things were made and exist. You uphold all things by the word of your power. You work all things according to the counsel of your will. With confidence, we offer you our prayers and petitions with supplication and thanksgiving. Sovereign God, comfort and encourage the persecuted church. For those who live and die because they love you above all others. Empower our witness so we may be salt and light in a world consumed with fear and uncertainty. We pray for those now struggling with job loss, financial loss, broken hearts and broken relationships. For those with mental and physical health issues. For those trying to overcome dependency and addiction problems. For the homeless and the socially excluded. For those struggling to access help at this time. Equip us, Lord, to be your hands and feet, in love to reach out to those who feel they're unreachable or unlovable. For your glory. Lord Jesus, the book of Ruth starts in a place of famine, loss, grief and uncertainty, but it ends with a place in your genealogy. Whatever the circumstances, we can be sure that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. We praise you, Sovereign Lord, you are the Alpha and the Omega. You know the beginning from the end. And we are secure in that truth. We are safe in you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And amen. And amen. Thank you, Amanda and Michael, for that. We'll be running an online marriage course from October 2nd. There's no doubt that marriage is difficult and might be even more so during lockdown. And this is a great opportunity to reconnect with your spouse and get some tips from a great couple in church, Tony and Lorraine. And it might be better than falling asleep in front of Netflix. Uh, we have a short video to tell you a little bit more about it. 
Marriage involves two people. They meet. You found me really attractive, really quickly. <laughs> they fall in love. She's passionate. <laughs> They get married and embark on a relationship that's designed to be one of increasing intimacy. I really couldn't see my life without her. But that's not automatic. We have to keep working at our marriage. Because I wasn't getting much affirmation, I started getting that from other places. Our marriage was nearly over. If you start building good habits in your relationship, you'll be reaping the effects of those choices in 5, 10 or 20 years' time. I can't let my past define my future. We have to build our own reality. The aim of the marriage course is to strengthen the connection between you as a couple. Love grows us. This is not a silly sentimental idea. This is science fact. How about one that we don't really hear about? How about this one? Fun. Marriage ought to be fun. If you're not having fun, what's the point? The marriage course is built on universal principles that are relevant to any couple anywhere. In years to come, you'll look back on having built a marriage as perhaps the most important achievement of all in your lives. That looks great. Uh, if you're interested, email the church office. Uh, and just another note that uh, it's not a dating course, but uh, if you're interested in meeting a spouse, uh, the sermon has some great tips as well. Uh, our reading is from Ruth 3 and will be read by the lovely Becky Campbell. Morning, church. We hope everyone is well this morning. We're really missing you all. We're missing seeing all your faces and we're missing gathering together to worship our God. Let us come together and concentrate on the word of the Lord. The reading for this morning comes from Ruth chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative, with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash therefore and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, All that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then, as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognise another. And he said, Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, Bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. This is the word of God. Amen. 
Good morning. It's really good to be with you. Um, Becky, thank you so much for, for reading Ruth chapter 3. This is the third sermon in our series going through the book of Ruth, which is this beautiful love story in the Old Testament. Chapter 3 is a little bit odd. I, I had a few people asking me this week how I was going to preach it. Uh, and as you heard it read, you might be wondering the same thing. In my Bible, the sections will have headings and the section of this heading in mine is Ruth and Boaz at the threshing floor. If I had to title it, I would title it Advice Not to Give to Your Daughter. And Natasha said a little bit in, earlier in the service that I was going to be giving you dating advice. This is not going to happen. This is not the chapter to turn to for dating advice. However, there's a lot in this book, especially in this chapter, that is worth listening to, just not for dating advice. In short, what is happening is Naomi wants to set up Ruth and Boaz. Boaz is their redeemer, somebody who can get them out of their difficult situation by marrying them and bringing them in, into his family and then continuing on their uh, husband's uh, lineage. And, and so what Naomi does is she tells Ruth to get all dolled up, um, to, to put on a, a nice robe to make herself smell really good, and then go to the place where Boaz is sleeping. Now, he's supposed to wait till he's done a hard day work, he's had a lot of food, and he's had a lot of wine, and then to spy out where he goes to sleep. And when he does, she's supposed to silently sneak up and cuddle up next to him, and then when he wakes up, say, what do you want me to do? This is not advice that you want to give to anyone. This is not advice that you want to give to your daughter. This is not how to find a husband. But that's what's going on in this chapter. Now, later on in the Bible, there, there's a blind man who comes up to Jesus and says, what is it that you want me to do for you? I remember reading that as a, as a teenager and thinking that's such a silly question. Of course we know what the man wants Jesus to do. But as I reflect on it now, I don't think it's that silly of a question. Many of us don't spend much time thinking about what is it that we actually want. And because we don't spend that time really digging deeply into our minds and our wills and our hearts, asking the question, what is it that we want? What we want tends to be very shallow and driven by the moment. And what this does is make things like advertising so potent in our life because they're creating these desires in our life. They're telling us we need to have this, we need to have that. And we have no way of really combating it because we don't really know what we want and so we'll accept whatever anyone is telling us, you should want this. But if we ask that question, what is it that you want? If we ask that question of the three characters in this chapter, if we ask Naomi, what does, what does she want? If we ask Ruth, what is it that she wants? If we ask Boaz, what is it that he wants? We might begin to have our wants shaped in a similar way, shaped in a Jesus way. What is it that Naomi wants? Now, we, we meet Naomi in, in chapter 1 and chapter 2 and again here, and she's gone through a really bitter time, so much so that she changes her name from sweetness, Naomi, to Mara, which means bitter. And you can imagine her being very self-focused because tends to be bitter people tend to be very self-focused. They live about themselves. And if you're bitter, this is probably what you're like, is, is you've made your life about yourself. And we can imagine... This is where, where Naomi is. Naomi wants to put Ruth in this really vulnerable position because she doesn't really care about Ruth. She just wants her husband's name to be carried on by Boaz. She wants her son's names to be carried on. She wants her, her, her land cared for by this good farmer, Boaz. And so she puts Ruth into this vulnerable position so her needs are met. It would be fair to assume this, but this isn't actually what Naomi is, is doing. Naomi, uh, we, we see what Naomi's intention is because it says, depending on the translation that you read, it might say home. My, the, the translation that Becky read says rest. Naomi wants to find rest, not for herself, but for Ruth. What drives Naomi is not actually selfish ambition, but a deep love, a deep growing love for her daughter-in-law. She wants rest and security for Ruth. Now, rest is a big theme that runs its way through the whole Bible. One of the great verses is what Jesus says, Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Hebrews 4 is this, this chapter in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, is, is about rest. And it says there is a, a promise that still stands today that God has made to his people, that there is a rest to be found. And if you hear God's voice, if you hear what he's telling you, go and do it obediently and you'll find rest. A theologian that I've often quoted, or a quote by a theologian that I've often quoted by St. Augustine, wrote that we were created for union with fellowship, with rest in God, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. Naomi seeks rest for Ruth, and she knows that her rest will be found in a redeemer. And we see that, that temporarily fulfilled in the redeemer Boaz, but Boaz is, the, is this character who points us to a greater Boaz, who points us to Jesus. Rest is ultimately found in the godly redeemer called Jesus. But Ruth is able to find a temporary rest in someone who really emulates, who shows the character of Jesus Christ. And there is a longing in all of our human hearts to find rest rest. But we are restless until we find it in, in, in Jesus. And so this is what Naomi wants. And maybe, maybe you're in a similar position as Naomi. You want rest for yourself or, or for, for loved ones. Na- Naomi encourages uh, Ruth to go and find her rest in this godly man called Boaz who points us to the godly man, Jesus Christ. What is it that Ruth wants? We, we meet again Ruth in chapter 1 and 2. And, and there's this deep desire that she has to love her mother-in-law. Now, I, I say this knowing that my mother-in-law often watches this. Mother-in-laws are great. They're fantastic. My mother-in-law is one of my favorite people. And I'm not just saying that um, because she's, she's really, um, I, I want to get in her good books. I think I'm in her good books. She, she, and Tony's mom is fantastic. Not all mother-in-laws are fantastic. And you can imagine the mother-in-law that Ruth finds herself in. Although although it seems Naomi's, her bitterness is starting to go away. For a long time, Ruth has been living with a really bitter woman. Which isn't easy. It is not easy to love bitter people. But we see Ruth's response to her in in chapter 1. She says, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I'm going to lodge. Where, where you die, I'm going to die, and I'm going to be buried by your side. Your God is, is going to be my God. Your people is going to be my people. It seems as though somehow Ruth has encountered the God of the Hebrews through Elimelech, her father-in-law, through her husbands, and through her mother-in-law. That somehow she has got a glimpse of the God of the Bible. A God of, of steadfast, committed love. Uh, I mentioned in the first sermon that Jewish commentators say that the big theme of, of Ruth is commitment. And there's a Hebrew word for that, has said, which is steadfast love, committed love, love that is committed to love the other sacrificially, even if the other person doesn't respond. And, and we see that God has his love for uh, the, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, the, the Jews, and, and, and often they, they walk away, they break covenant, they break God's laws, but God is faithful to his promise to love them. Even though they don't return the love, he loves them sacrificially. This is the love of God. It is a committed love. And commitment is a big theme of the book of Ruth. Commitment in the 21st century, especially in Britain, is not a virtue that is highly valued. And I think it's been much more highly valued in the past. Now, I'm not nostalgic about the past. This is a mistake. It is a mistake to look at the, the, the years past as the good old days. They are never that, but there is a, a tendency within the human mind to reflect better on the past than the present. Nostalgia. But nostalgia is often a lie. Now, I think it's true that commitment, uh, the valuing of, the, of commitment is less so than it was in the past. But there were virtues in the past that were not as highly valued as they are today. So, so this isn't just saying the good old days were, 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 were good and today's bad. That's not the case. But commitment is not uh, a, 
as strongly valued today as it should be. And this is reflected in marriages. There are far few marriages uh, now happening every year in, in Britain. Um, and clear, there, there, there are more divorces. And those who get married, this is interesting. Uh, um, I was looking at some st- statistics about marriage that the people who get married now, 88% of them have been cohabiting. They've been living together before they get married. Interestingly about that is if you cohabit before you get married, it is a greater chance of you getting divorced than those who don't cohabitate before getting married. And there's lots of theories behind why that's the case, but over, over a decade of stats have been, been studied, and that is the case. You are more likely to get divorced if you live together before you get married. I think one of the reasons why this is the, the case, and what, one of the prevailing theories, is that this this action of of living together like married couples do is based not purely on commitment. There is this get out clause that, okay, we're going to try being married, but if things don't work out, then I can can escape or you can escape. And it seems like that founding the, the coming together on this get out clause heightens the chance of of the, the marriages breaking apart. Commitment is an amazingly transformative thing. When Jewish commentators talk about the commitment, this Hebrew has said, translated it as steadfast love. Steadfast love, sacrificial love, committed love is transformative. It is that I'm committed to loving you no matter what you do. And it seems as though this type of love has been the thing that has begun to soften Naomi's hardness. This has begun to bring sweetness to her bitterness. And this has said, this committed love is, is, a, is the major theme that runs its way through the Bible. It is God's love. But it's also a, a, a love that weaves its way through, through all, all, all sorts of literature. I might get in trouble with a few of you, but I love the books of Harry Potter. Um, And the big theme that runs through those those seven books is that in a world full of evil, even when it's really powerful, there is something which overcomes such evil, and it is sacrificial love. And and so you have this evil wizard in, in Harry Potter, Voldemort, and he is constantly overcome by sacrificial love. And this is the theme of the Bible. The evil of this world, which is powerful, is overcome by the hesed, the sacrificial, the committed love of God seen in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. His sacrificial death overcomes the evil in you and me, overcomes the evil of this world. It is the only hope for this world is the sacrificial love of God demonstrated at its full force on the cross death of Jesus Christ. Ruth, what does Ruth want? She wants to live a life of hesed, of committed love, committed to love her mother-in-law, and now as we'll see, a commitment to love Boaz. What is it that Boaz wants? Boaz, after a hard day work of having a good meal and having some wine, goes to have a good night rest so he can wake up the next morning and have another hard day working the harvest and harvesting the fields. And while sleeping, he has this young, attractive uh, woman, unattached, a foreigner, come up and lie next to, to you at night. What does he do? Now think about what does he do in the context of that he's in. He's in the time of the judges where everyone's doing what is right in their own eyes. He could simply abuse the situation that he finds himself in. Use and abuse Ruth and send her away. But Boaz is not interested in having a good time. Boaz is interested in having a good legacy. And he goes out of his way to protect Ruth in this situation. 
He says, okay, stay here the night, because if, you, if a young woman goes wandering through the fields at night, she's putting herself in incredible risk. Be lots of, of, of farmers who, who are harvesting would put herself at incredible risk of doing it. But then he sends her out just as it's beginning to, to get dawn so she can get home safely, but in a way that her rep- reputation is still intact because it might just seem that the, the two were, were hooking up for a one-night stand, but that's not what, what Boaz is interested in. And then he loads her up with with food and says, look, I I would love to be your redeemer, but there is a family member who's closer than me, but don't worry, I'll sort this out. And he praises praises, uh, Ruth for for her kindness. And now again, it it would be unusual for a person like Boaz to to not be married. A, a, A prominent, older a uh, farmer to not be married in this, in this situation would have been re- rather unusual. So it's likely that he, he's a widower. But again, he, he is interested not in just having a good time. He's interested in having a, a good legacy. I stand on the shoulders of, of, a, of a man who sought to have a, a good legacy. My great-grandfather was a, a German-speaking Baptist minister in, in Poland, in the U- Ukraine, and then he was exiled to Siberia, uh, and then he, he immigrated quickly to, to Canada. And he had 16 children, many of whom were, were ministers, and there, those children had children. My, my mother is one of the grandchildren of this, this man, and, and I'm one of his great-grandchildren, and, he, and his legacy is having many people who are Ministers who are missionaries, people who, who love Jesus and want other people to, to know Jesus as well. And my great-grandfather had a hard life, but he was not interested in having a cozy, comfortable life. He was interested in having a good legacy. And, and that desire ripples out through, through generations. And my, my hope and prayer is that his legacy will continue in the, in the next generation of my kids and, and their cousins and, and second cousins and so on. This is the kind of man that Boaz was. He was interested in having a good legacy, not just a good time. Now, some of you, you're going to be listening to this series and you're not married or, or you haven't had kids. This does not preclude you from having a good legacy. The life of Boaz points not to wonderful marriage, but points to a wonderful redeemer, a wonderful savior, Jesus, who never got married, never had kids, and has the longest lasting legacy, the most profound legacy of any other person who's walked on this earth. And we've seen people committed to Jesus Christ who have not been married, who have not had kids, who have a long lasting legacy. Because the legacy is not just having kids. The legacy is on reflecting the has said committed love to the world around us. And that is lo- much longer lasting than having children. So what is it that you want? If Jesus comes up to you like he did the blind man, if Jesus came up to, as we in our minds have had with with Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, if Jesus comes up to you and says, what is it that you want? How are you going to respond? You need to spend some time thinking about this or you're going to be wasting your life. You need to spend some time thinking about what is it that you want. Or you will just go with the flow and seek a good time rather than a good legacy. You'll have a a superficial, shallow love rather than this deep, committed, has said love. You'll be seeking pleasure and comfort rather than a deep, satisfying rest. Disciples of Jesus have a focused life. We are called to have a focused life, and it starts by focusing on him. And the great thing about this chapter 3 is Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz help us focus our eyes on Jesus Christ. Naomi wanted rest and security for loved ones that only a redeemer could provide. Ruth wanted a love of Hesed, committed love. 
She had gotten a glimpse of the love of God, the Hesed love of God, and it had transformed her into someone who lived a life of Hesed love. Boaz wanted to have a legacy. He wasn't interested in just having a good time. He was interested in having a good legacy. The only one who, where rest is found is, is only in Jesus. And our hearts are restless until we find our rest in him. The only one that makes committed love possible is when we get con- connected to his Hesed love. When we receive his Hesed love. And when we focus on living for his legacy, when we are focused on living for the legacy of Jesus Christ, that he would be seen as great, then we will begin to see his legacy impact our legacy. And we'd be far more interested in having a legacy that reflects good on him than having a good time now. Is what you want now Christ-shaped? Because it's only there where real life is found. In a few moments, we're, we're going to be listening to a song, and I encourage you as you listen to the song, and I encourage you beyond the song, over the next day or the next weeks, spend some time, carve out some time in your calendar where you will be reflecting on what is it that you want. Is it Christ-shaped, or is it something much more shallow? I'm going to pray for us now. Jesus, thank you so much for, for the scriptures, that we stand under this wonderful book that we call the Bible, and it shapes what we want, it shapes how we view life. Would you make us a people who seek to have a deep, satisfying rest in Jesus for ourselves and for our loved ones? Would you help us to encounter your Hesed committed love and therefore become people who live out committed love? love. Would you help us to be more interested in having a good legacy than simply having a good time? Would you, by your spirit, do a work in us that we would reflect these people that we meet in the book of Ruth? Would you help us as we walk through this world to be people who positively impact those around us, that they would get a glimpse of your committed, unwavering, always faithful love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now reflect on what you've heard as we listen to this song. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. the 
Joe and Martin. As ever, if you need anything, please don't hesitate to contact Jeff. His email details are below. Uh, we started our first service back last week, and it was so special to be together in the physical sense again. Uh, we'll be having another service tonight, which you should have booked online on Church Suite. Uh, I feel like I'm a few tenses there in the past, the present, and the future all at once. Um, but if you would like to book for next week, get on there quickly as there are just 30 spaces and it would be good to have as many different people uh, book in. Um, and we know that we might not, we won't be affected by the restrictions um, from Monday, so we'll still be good to go ahead. Um, if you haven't downloaded Church Suite as yet, uh, please do because that's how you book. And if you need any help, there are people who can help you, so don't struggle on your own. We'll have a closing song from Joe and Martin and then our weekly montage of church folk. If you haven't sent in a photo as yet, or even if you've never even physically come to the church, uh, but watch us online, we'd love to see your face up there too. So send us in your pics and your name so we know who you are uh, and send it to Jeff. We're all one family in God. Uh, or even if you're doing a video of you and your kids learning the memory verse, we'd love to see that. Uh, and we'd love to see as many memory verses as we can. And thank you for being with us today. And to close, let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you and keep you in the palm of his hand this week. Bye.
Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with Blessed Redeemer, live him well. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with Blessed Redeemer, live in world. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures. no one like you there is no beside